I first met Johanna Drucker at a small press book fair in Bryant Park in 1977. I'm a little embarrassed to say how long ago it was. And our mutual interest in visual and verbal art and work at their intersection has been a common bond ever since. We've had many intense and fruitful conversations on painting, artist books, and critical issues. In addition, Johanna contributed an essay to the very first issue of Meaning, the journal that I co-edited with Mira Shore, who's sitting there. And um, that was published in 1986. She also contributed to our most recent issue of Meaning Online, number four, on the links between feminism and art. And in addition to that, we collaborated on a book together called A Girl's Life that was published by Granary Books in 2002. Johanna Drucker is the Robertson Professor of Media Studies at the University of Virginia and a professor in the Department of English at Virginia. She's well known for her publications on the history of written forms, typography, design, and visual poetics. Her most recent critical work, Sweet Dreams, Contemporary Art and Complicity, was published by the University of Chicago Press in spring 2005. In addition to her scholarly work, Drucker is internationally known as a book artist and experimental visual poet. Her work has been exhibited and collected in special collections in libraries and museums, including the Getty, the Whitney Museum, the New York Public Library, and Harvard, and many others. In 2000, she helped establish the Speculative Computing Laboratory, a research group dedicated to exploring experimental projects in humanities computing. Her current work fo focuses on aesthetics and digital media, particularly graphical communication and the expressive character of visual form. She curated an exhibition in 2006 at the University of Virginia Art Museum titled Complicit. And her latest and most massive project is the history of graphic design which he's uh, worked on in collaboration with Emily McVarish, and it will be published by Prentice Hall in February of 2008. So please welcome Johanna Drucker. Thanks very much, and thank you all for coming. In 1994, Alfredo Yar did an exhibit called The Lament of Images. The lament that he was describing in that piece was an elegy and a crisis. It was a personal crisis for him. He had been in Rwanda photographing the tragedies and had had a kind of psychological blindness and had come to realize that the project of documentation that he was involved with was one that he no longer could completely believe in. And there's a double aspect to that crisis. On the one hand, it's a crisis of representation, and it's been written about in that way. And the crisis of representation is, is it possible anymore in our image-saturated culture to make any kind of images that matter? How can they matter? And there's another crisis here, however, which is a crisis of knowledge. And the crisis of knowledge has longer historical roots that go back to the ways in which we understand the relationship between visual representation and knowledge, in particular with respect to mechanical reproduction, the coming of the printing press, the stabilization of knowledge within technologies of reproduction that allow knowledge to circulate in visual form. What can we know and how can we know it looking at a visual image? So the lament that Yar is describing has both a long historical trajectory in terms of that issue of knowledge and representation, and it has a shorter, more tragic poignancy within the history of the avant-garde and its place within the larger picture of modernism, where we have come to believe that there is a political efficacy for images and that art has a task as the moral conscience of the culture. And this is a concept that goes back to Romanticism and the conviction that the world is broken and that the task of art is to put it right. And that's true in some sense. The world is broken 
and it is the task of all thinking persons to put it right. But the legacy that comes to us through modernism and then the avant-garde and, and aesthetics as it comes to be formulated after the invention of political philosophy in the middle of the 19th century has itself become ossified in ways that no longer allow us to engage with the process of knowing, aesthetics as a form of knowing. And that's the move I'd like to sketch tonight, is to move from a mid-20th century formulation of aesthetics, in particular the work of Adorno, into a concept of aesthesis as a specialized form of knowledge and knowing. I'm going to start with this absolutely shameless and amazing piece of work, because it is probably the piece of work we would all most like to ignore. It is the piece of work we would like to have go away. It is the piece of work that, in a sense, calls out and says, everything you would like to believe about what art is and how it functions isn't true. All right? There's a whole set of issues that come about through the way that Damien Hirst's star-studded, diamond-encrusted, platinum disco ball skull, this death head bauble, this piece of shameless bling, has managed to triumph and trump you know, the art world high-stakes gamble game. And here it is in all of its you know, absolutely in-your-face absurdity. So it is a kitsch object. It has very little to do with political efficacy or any kind of faith in the secularized notions of salvation and redemption that we associate with the avant-garde. Its na very name for the love of God, the fact that it debuted in an exhibition that had the apt name Beyond Belief, and that the exhibition itself, when the skull was originally um, exhibited, had a celebrity spectacle form to it. There were circles of hell into which the various visitors were placed so that only those who were the utterly select were admitted to the you know, holy of holies. And there's some wonderful you know, wry British descriptions of these particular events. And of course they had you know, large thug-like guards around to make you understand that this was a very valuable piece of work. And so here we have this you know, monst monstrous thing that is a complete artifice, absolutely created in order to stage itself within the machinations and manipulations of the art world's industries. What are we to make of this? We cannot let it go away. In fact, it is the object on which any, I, any idea of what art is what its identity is and how it functions in our culture must come to terms with this um, piece, if only because it is the piece that commanded the highest price tag by a living artist. So it says something to us. In a peculiar and perverse way, I would suggest that this is, at a hundred, uh, almost a century's remove, a kind of dialogue with Marcel Duchamp's ready-made rather than take a piece of you know, mass-produced, inherently worthless plumbing and invert it, both physically and um, you know, in terms of its value, by the way that the naming, framing, pointing functions of art world institutions can be used to muster a framework of value in which the ready-made registers. Here we have, instead, Hearst making this thing in order to absolutely reify the value of capital. It is the only thing this does. It shows that art, works of art and artists can command an, an, an enormous amount of capital and then reify that value through using absurdly, inherently valuable objects within their production. So it is that capacity to command that the work demonstrates and reifies. Like it? Doesn't matter if I like it or not. It's there. However, there's a lot of work that I like a great deal that is in the world of contemporary art. And so before I sketch the move from aesthetics to aesthesis, I'm going to talk about a piece that I happened to encounter in Dallas in November by Phil Collins. You're looking at a still image of a karaoke video. 
and this being the age of YouTube, and you're sitting here with your Blackberries, you can go ahead and Google this and watch the videos while I talk to you. Um, the piece is called The World Won't Listen. And it is a piece about global fanzine culture. It's about the Smiths. This, and being myself, what did I know about the Smiths? Okay, so I had to be educated to understand who this British punk rock you know, band was from 20 some years ago and their importance in a global fan culture. And for those of you who don't know the piece, what Phil Collins did, he's a British artist, he went to Jakarta, Istanbul, and Bogota. He put out a call in, in all three of these cities for fans of the Smiths to come. And then he staged karaoke performances of all the songs on the album, The World Won't Listen. So, of course, there are many, many people who came forward. I mean, the Smiths have an international following. And um, so Collins filmed them in these karaoke performances. And they're absolutely stunning performances. And part of what's interesting about it is they are deeply human. Every single performance shows somebody coming and going from their own fantasy of what it would be to be Morrissey, right, to be the Smiths. So they never occupy the position of fantasy, but they show the fantasy and the individual character of every performance and every individual is staged against these backdrops. Now the backdrops are also very funny. He uses American Southwest, Tropical Paradise, Hawaii Vacation. I mean, these are the images out of bad travel posters. These are fantasies of escape, you know, in vacation packages, three nights, four days. All right, so the entire um, of this imagery is conceived within a, com a consumer culture and a kind of low-end consumer culture. So Colin's relationship to this material is also very interesting. He's a Smith fan. That's why he did this. He loves the Smiths. He's not doing cult studs, you know. He's not standing and saying, I'm so superior to, you know, the discourse of international fanzine culture. Uh-uh. He is international fanzine culture. He's inside of that condition of admiration. And so that in itself is also really interesting. Finally, what relates this in any way to the Hearst piece? This is an expensive piece to produce. It also required the command of a considerable amount of capital and labor. The piece was installed exquisitely in the Dallas Museum of Art, exquisitely. And so the deep, inky theater, the you know, sort of elaborate, huge bays, the large scale projection absorb you in this completely consumable spectacle completely pleasurable. You stand there and you watch these different bodies, these different you know, characters, these different movements. It is a complete deconstruction in the most sophisticated visual sense of what it is for the culture industries to have this kind of global reach, and yet it is never outside of or superior to its subjects. It is absolutely in sync with and sympathetic to the humanity and aspirations of the people who are pictured in this. So again, a very different kind of project. I'll let Patrick Costello's piece sit up here for a minute. Criticism, I want to sketch the sort of broader framework here, the sort of uh, ar framing argument of what I want to put forth here. Criticism is engaged with interpretation. Its task is to help you read, it's to do a reading, it's to perform a reading, it's to lead you into a work and give you a gloss and a handle on it. It says, criticism says, I have a way to look at this and I'll share it with you and then you will perhaps take away from the work a different kind of experience. It's explanatory, discursive, user friendly, sometimes artists not so friendly, but the idea is to really make a bridge. Theory on the other hand, has a very different task. And what I'm engaged with tonight is trying to make a shift in aesthetic theory from aesthetics to a thesis, which I'll explain in a moment. Aesthetic theory takes as its task the definition of a set of parameters, 
on which to understand the identity and function of works of art. A very different project than criticism. How do we understand what the identity and function of works of art are at any given point in historical time and cultural time? What is it we expect from them? How do we recognize them? How do we know it's a work of art? How do we know what we expect from the work? Now we know in our time that much of our understanding of how we conceive of the identity and function of works of art does come to us through the legacies of modernism and the legacies of the avant-garde. The avant-garde is a kind of special branch of modernism, right? It's a sort of, you know, heavier, muscly version of modernism. But modernism is a larger historical construct. But modernism, remember, begins at the same time as aesthetics. If we look in the long view of the history of aesthetics, beginning of the, the end of the 18th century is also the advent of modernism, and that's not surprising. So if we were to look in a historical perspective, we would see that the waves of romanticism that arise in response, and the, the tenets of romanticism, its responses to industrialization, its, its crying out for some kind of you know, humanistic, emotive response to the mechanization and the numbing effects of industrialization, arise at the same time as the science of aesthetics. Aesthetics is that branch of philosophy that attends to the study of perception. It is concerned with sensation and perception. That's what aesthetics attends to. But aesthetic theory, because now we, we, we wed theory with aesthetics, aesthetic theory becomes involved in either the history of objects, and a kind of study of their formal properties, their identity, their function and operation. And we can think of a whole history of theorists who are concerned with the study of objects. But it is also concerned with the study of experience, the specialized aesthetic experience, a specialized form of knowledge and experience. And it's that aspect of aesthetics which really comes right out of Baumgarten, the, the refinement of sensibility, the cultivation of taste, um, 18th century, that I'm trying to revive in talking about aesthesis. I'd like to make an argument that aesthesis is a way to recover a role for artistic objects, artistic practice, and aesthetic experience that has to do with specialized forms of knowing, ways of knowing, ways of thinking, ways of having experience. The work that you see on the screen here is by a young artist named Patrick Costello. And Costello and a number of his friends organized an exhibition in Charlottesville this summer. Charlottesville? Where's that? Someplace south of the Mason-Dixon line. Oh, I never looked down there. Okay. In Charlottesville, they organized this exhibit. And <laughs> it's true. And so in Charlottesville, they organized an exhibit called Fuzz. So cute. And the artists in the Fuzz exhibit are artists like this, young Patrick, who has this little character himself in his little pajamas, his Dr. Denton's little felt head, okay, on this little kind of fake wood board background. And, you know, there's little Nemo, there's, you know, the Lost Boys, there's Peter Pan, there's all those little felt finger puppets. It's all very sweet, it's all very kind of familial, it's all very nice, it's all very kind of comfy, cozy. We've seen this kind of work before, we know this kind of work. I mean, we've been around, you know, for <laughs> several decades and seen the kind of combinatoric, you know, mass culture, kitsch production, reproduction. These are 20-year-olds, 18, 19-year-olds. What are they doing? What are they thinking? There's not a critical bone in Patrick's body. He is the sweetest creature, and his use of these materials is because this is the world he comes from. This vocabulary of already made things is what forms the world for him. There is no raw nature out there that he cooks into culture. There's only the culture stew from which he is remaking the possibilities of his own identity, little Nemo Patrick, and his experience. 
Now, I put this work in here because, again, I'm interested in this kind of wide range. You start with, you know, Alfredo Yar, Damien Hurst, Phil Collins, Patrick Costello, quite a range of different kinds of characters. And I'm going to move also into an even more obscure and actually impossible to see. Oh, no. This is another piece from the Fuzz exhibit. Again, we, you know, we've been here, done this for um, several decades. And I find it very endearing to watch this um, sort of uh, particular tradition of uh, remaking um, going on. Um, and I'm going to talk about this particular work in a moment by Dean Das. Um, but let me stay with uh, this world for a moment because what I'd like to do is to sketch out for you the particulars of the shift I want to make. And the shift, as I said, is from aesthetics to its thesis. I spent the summer reading Adorno's aesthetic theory. And I did that for a reason. Um, I'm not going to tell you the reason, except that I felt that, <laughs> no. The reason is, Adorno is what we have. Adorno is the last great system maker in terms of aesthetics. Adorno is the last, I mean, I have a terrible flippant remark, but I really believe it. Adorno is the, you know, symptom of the pathology that was high modernism. And it's tragic. And when you read aesthetic theory, you see Adorno constantly grappling to try to talk himself into his own belief system. It's a game that's already up. He knows it's going to fail. And yet he continues to try to make the argument. And the argument he's trying to make really comes down to four principles. And these four principles are that art is autonomous, art is distinct from things in nature by its madeness, works of art are distinct from other objects by their non-self-identical character, and I'll come back and explain what that means in a moment, and finally, works of art by their non-self-identical, autonomous madeness, remove themselves from the world of utilitarian and means and useful, purposeful objects, and in so doing, become resistant. Now, Adorno is doing this for a reason. He is caught, after all, between the Philistines of fascism and the Philistines of the culture industries. He sees no possibility for the salvation of Western culture and thought. So his project really is a historical project. It's a, it's a project of desperation. So I have absolute respect for it. The difficulty is not with Adorno, but with what happens to Adorno in the hands of the Latter-day Saints of Adorno, the apostles of high modernism. And I use those words deliberately because Adorno becomes sacralized and any chunk or citation of Adorno becomes a kind of, you know, moment of recognition and ritual of that, of that sacralization. And the problem is that it doesn't fit. Adorno does not fit the world of Patrick Costello or Damien Hirst or Phil Collins. Now, Phil Collins is the piece here that is most comfortable um, his work is most comfortable with the kind of critical positions that can be pulled out from Adorno, except that, remember, Collins loves the world he's in. He does not despise it. He does not see himself as morally superior to the world that he is part of. And that's extremely important, I think, as a critique of cultural studies. Um, my critiques of cultural studies are not kind. <laughs> so, you know, I think it's intellectually thin and morally bankrupt, but just that. So, but we can come back. We can fight that one out. Um, so let me go back to these four tenets of Adorno and then show you how I want to shift into this concept of his thesis. And I'll go back at that point to the work of, of uh, Damien Hirst. Um, autonomy, you know what it means. I don't have to explain it to you. But the idea that the world of art and works of art are separate, distinct from other kinds of made objects is the basic premise of autonomy. It comes to be extended to describe art as a separate sphere, distinct and above, independent of the other worlds and the other domains in which we daily participate. The assumption that comes out of the theory of autonomy is that somehow art is above the ideologies, that it's outside of them. It's not. And I'll try to prove that. 
All right, not that I think you need convincing. Um, madeness. For Adorno, madeness has to do with the transformation of raw nature into culture. And he says it over and over again. It's the, it's the remnant of 19th century philosophy. And again, this is where Patrick Costello and the um, fuzz creatures are so important to me. We don't have nature. When did we have nature? Nature was a category invented by culture in order to satisfy itself in relationship to various others. But nature's long gone. It's been gone for a long time. We only have culture. We have many raw conditions and cooked conditions of culture that we continually remake. So madeness, in Adorno's terms, have to be reformulated. It doesn't fit. Non-self-identicality. That's my favorite. I actually love non-self-identicality. I wish I could continue to believe in it because it's a wonderful concept. What Adorno means by non-self-identicality, um, I'm actually considering translating Adorno. <laughs> All right. Babblefish, right? Okay. Non-self-identicality means that the form of, of, that the conception in a work of art and its material expression are not one and the same. Oh, the idea and the expression are not self-identical. I believe that. Conceptualism taught us that. We've had 100 years of conceptualism showing us that. I believe. I completely believe that. Of course, I believed it a long time ago as well. I think you could say the same thing about a fork. The idea of a fork and its expression are not the same. Didn't Joseph Kozuth make a lot of pieces about that some time ago? One and three chairs, one and three umbrellas? Oh, I see. But for Adorno, this condition of non-self-identicality means that works of art do not resolve. They do not become unitary. They don't have identity. They can't be readily reified. They can't be put in your pocket. They don't turn into, as he calls them, hard consumer objects that would just allow you mere pleasure. Ooh, <laughs> mere pleasure. Hey, wait a minute. I'm starting to see some things I would like to fix in this theoretical position. Pleasure will be among them. It's coming back. All right. Resistance. OK, so you have autonomy, and you have madeness, and you have non-self-identicality. And then you had this notion of resistance. And again, remember that this is high modernism. This is a pathology. This is a particular set of responses, critical, aesthetic, political, philosophical, to historical conditions. And so therefore, when Adorno says there has to be a way to resist the mind-numbing political effects of both fascism and the culture industry, and we do that through a kind of difficulty that removes something from that sphere of consumption, he's doing it because he wants to save something. So again, I'm not in, I have complete respect for where he's coming from. It just doesn't fit. Most of the work that calls itself resistant in our era, I mean, Damien Hirst, is that resistant? Quite the contrary. So we need a new terminology. We need a new vocabulary for talking about the identity and function of works of art in contemporary culture. But even more, I think uh, my shift here is to shift from just objects and identities into a theory of knowledge. Aesthesis is aesthetic knowledge, a specialized form of knowledge. What is the nature of knowing that is grounded in sensual experience that is premised on very contemporary theories of epistemology. What would that look like? What would that be? Well, we'd want to start with cognitive studies, as a matter of fact, very late, recent cognitive studies, and think not in Newtonian, mechanistic ways about objects as if they're discrete, about readings as if they're separate from the circumstances, objects as if they don't inhabit cultural social systems of production, but we want to think in terms of codependent relationships, the emergent character of experience, which is provocative, sustainable, because there are, in fact, some works that are interesting, and they're interesting in particular ways, and they push us to activities of knowing and knowledge. And that's what I'd like to formulate. So I'm going to sort of sketch that out um, in a couple of minutes here and then pause for, uh, sort of pull it together and pause for questions. <clears throat> what would be the shifts of term? I would take autonomy and I would shift it to complicity and codependence. Complicity because we are within 
the ecologies of the culture we inhabit. Art activity is no different, and art production and consumption is no different in some sense than food production and consumption and other forms of commodity production and consumption. It's rarefied production. It has the capability to do something that most forms of consumption don't do, but not uniquely. A very well-cultivated cheese you know, does that work as well. In other words, it causes you to think again about what it is you think you know. That ultimately is what I ask of works of art, that they, they give me a way to think again. I think again. Oh, I like that. That is pleasurable to me. It's a drug. It's a mind fix. My mind loves to have to think again. As I said to my friend today, the unimagined life is not worth living. Right? Okay, so it's this capacity to think again. So we have to get rid of this notion of autonomy. I think it's actually quite long gone, but I would replace it again with complicity. And, and then this notion of codependence, that nothing exists discreetly, nothing exists independently. There's no autonomous, discrete object. Damien Hirst's skull, that little monstrous thing at the beginning here, isn't a thing in itself. It's a thing because of the way it's able to position itself within all these many systems of spectacular consumption, of the publicity machines, of the machinations and apparatuses. That's what that thing is. It's not a thing in itself. It's codependent with the circumstances it is able to use to position itself and appear to be a thing. So I would say codependence and complicity. For madeness, we have to switch um, away from, he told me earlier he was leaving, so it's not, <laughs> it's not a signal for you all to get up and go. Um, madeness, um, we would say, is not of nature, but of culture. It has to do with reformulations, rather than this idea that you are taking something from the raw. In other words, it's the making anew of meaning. Non-self-identicality has to be pushed towards provocation. I do think that there are characteristics to interesting works that sustain a provocative dialogue with the reader-viewer, but it is the relationship. It is not inherent in the object. The objects have capabilities, um, and certain objects are more interesting than others. I will, you know, <laughs> defend that to, to the end. Um, there are things that are not interesting. There's bad art. I mean, there's art that's not worth paying attention to. We saw a bunch of art today. We were in Chelsea. There's a lot of stuff that's not worth paying attention to. And then there's work that's really interesting. And why is it interesting? Because it sustains a kind of dialogic relationship with you. It provokes you. There's a provocation. There's a sustained, um, you know, sort of, uh, again, remapping of the cognitive syn synapses. And finally, this notion of resistance. The notion of resistance will die hard among many because it is the last link to a kind of utopian belief system that came out of, again, it has a long history within modernism and certainly gets reformulated, as I said, in mid-19th century with the coming of political philosophy. And remember that the shift to political philosophy from regular philosophy is that rather than simply understanding or describing the condition of knowledge or sensation or the mind, the political philosophy said the point is to change it. So the task of change, which again, the world is broken, we do need to fix it, but that task of change that comes to be identified with the avant-garde and with the role of art assumes a moral hierarchy and a moral high ground for the artist in the work of art. And that seems to me to be highly suspect. And that's where I come back to complicity. We are not better than this other, we are not better than the world we inhabit. So change, yes. And again, I would say if you're thinking change, you know, you can think, um, I'll come back to Dean Das in one moment here. You can think in terms of activism. You know, there's activist art. And, you know, that's fine. Do activist art. But the notion that difficulty in and of itself is a form of resistance that performs some kind of political efficacy, it's just not true. 
it, it, it's what I call magical politics. You know, it's like where, where exactly does the transformation of power relations and you know political agency actually occur in those difficult works? It doesn't. Okay, so you know most works that are really really difficult and remove themselves really really far from consumption by being really really difficult remain really really difficult, can really really difficult to consume. I write really difficult work. I do really obscure things, but I don't imagine that they are making a transformation of the political structure. I do imagine and I do believe that they transform the meme world. That's what we do. We are meme makers. We transform. We reimagine. We remodel. We offer new models of cognition and new models of experience. And we produce that as an effect. We don't produce it inherently in objects. We produce it as an effect of what we do. I'll finish with the Dean Das um, pages and one or two more words about Hearst. These books by Dean Das, which you can barely see, they're very rarefied, you know, kind of highly beautiful aesthetic objects. You know, the pages are saturated with all kinds of wax and stains and, you know, very beautiful and very kind of imbued with a kind of artist dialogue with himself. And they're part of a pro two books, actually. Um, one is called uh, for, for um, Fracastoro uh, Castellano, and the other is called um, The Age of Partial Objects. And the first book is about syphilis and the discovery of syphilis as, a, as a, actually an epidemic and a disease, um, the beginning of understanding its, its you know, sort of transmission roots in the 16th century. Um, and it's quite beautiful and it again sort of is about the dying of the species and it's again an ecological um, you know sort of elegy it's about the you know the, the destruction of our world and what's interesting to me is it never says that it shows it in these elegant pages and in the way that the forms in the pages begin to evaporate what was a form becomes a trace and the central space of the of the page where easy reading might take place becomes empty and so it's fugitive, it's gone, it's ephemeral. The age of partial objects I became attracted to because the kind of theory of knowledge that I want to put forth here, this will be sort of the final point I make in the theoretical frame, is that the knowledge that the system builders, somebody like Adorno, were trying to create, were totalizing. In spite of himself, Adorno was, total, was trying to come up with a total system. We can't do that. We, we can't describe everything anymore. We know that. You can only produce knowledge from a place of partial knowledge, from the place from which you speak. And that recognition humbles you to a place that makes you understand that the experiential base of knowledge, sensation, perception, codependent relations, embodiedness, social and cultural systems of production, everything we learned from 30 years of critical theory, you know, real critical theory, um, is true. And we have to take it as true, which is that knowledge is partial. It's partial knowledge. It's not total knowledge. You cannot describe everything because to do that is to reify the very system of thought and to reify the objects within it. And reification is the death of knowledge. This was going to be my last slide, but I think maybe I just sort of said the last thing I need to say. Aesthetics to aesthesis, a shift from a totalizing system, a description of objects, their identity, and functions within a late utopian Marxist model to aesthesis, a specialized form of knowledge, pleasure, a mind drug, a rethinking, meme production, remodeling. Our cognition is constantly mutated and adapted. Cognitive studies shows that we're not hardwired. Kant was wrong. He couldn't know that. He couldn't know that any more than Newton could know that there's a probabilistic aspect to physics. They, were mechani they had mechanistic models. We're not mechanistic. We know that, in fact, cogn our, our cognition sh reshapes itself in relationship to experience. It doesn't just process things, and we don't just absorb. So aesthetic objects have tremendous potency and power for their force to offer us ways to reimagine. And that's where I'll stop.
Yes, Charles. I didn't want to be the first yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how these things work. I think my voice gets reified when I use it this way. I thought you were doing more of a two cheers for Adorno than an anti-Adorno. Mm. Uh, and although I think you're, you're quite right about aesthesis and partiality, it still seems to me that the heart of Adorno is to talk about, is, is against reification and a negative dialectics which is against expressive totalization. So it seemed to me that you were sort of pushing him more it, 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 in, into a direction that's opposite yours, but actually I think it's, it's more partially connected. I agree, Charles. I think my problem is not with Adorno, but the Adorno-ista, you know, <laughs> kind of mafia, because what happens is that Adorno has become reified and sacralized. Most people don't really read Adorno, which is why I spent the summer actually reading it and finding there were so many things in there, of course I believe and of course I like, but they're not adequate to describe the world we live in. And that was really my argument, because he is so filled with that late modern world. Well, because he can't deal with what you deal with. He can't deal with what you deal with in complicit. And of course, right. he had a real, an impossible, uh, he couldn't right. understand popular culture. No. Most famously, his stuff about jazz. So those are real gaps. But at the same time, negative dialectics is still anti-totalization. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I don't disagree with that, but I think the um, relationship of, of high art to popular culture has been grotesquely distorted in the kind of legacy of Adorno. So it's not Adorno, it's the legacy of Adorno with which you know, I have my arguments. It's this idea that there's a kind of um, you know, inherent resistance in the high art form that necessarily carries a political efficacy with it. And it's bogus. And again, it's premised on a kind of moral superiority that I just find, you know, really repugnant. And yet it's pervasive in the high academy in terms of critical positions. So that's really where my, that's my target, but that's been my target for a long time. So rather than attack that, what I'm trying to do now is sort of say, okay, um, let's, let's think about, you know, what kind of, um, you know, um, aesthetic theory would arise from these works, which are quite contemporary, um, where those relationships with mass culture and high culture um, are really, um, you know, uh, present within the conception of the work, not even after the fact. Um, I mean, I think, you know, art is a culture industry. And, you know, the, uh, how, how not? You know, how is it not? I mean, it's a production apparatus with its systems of distribution, reception, and investment in capital and so forth, don't you think? Sure. Yeah. The thing is that, I mean, the Damien Hirst is exactly a target that negative dialectics would work for because it's an example of the reification of capitalism, as you've said. But he would said. dismiss it. Right. Yeah. Whereas I, I can't dismiss it. I mean, I actually think, you know, I mean, I'm not as ready to just put that on the other side of a line and say that that line separates me from it. In other words, I, I actually think that's, that's, that's what's kind of terrifying about that is that in a way, you know, it, 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 it kind of puts us all on a continuum. There's something there um, and everybody will say, oh, not me. Oh, I don't, I don't want to be that. You know, I, I don't want to be the richest artist in the world. Not me. I don't want to be the most famous artist in the world. Oh, God. Um, you know, I don't want everybody to just, like, diss my work in public. Ew. Um, but, you know, <laughs> but I, I think, in a way, he's showing that that is, and he's exposing an aspect of what the art world is as a culture industry. And, you know, once that's exposed at that level, then the question is, well, you know, further down the food chain we can feel okay because it's, you know, kind of just a handmade object. But I think, in fact, no, we're all, I actually think that's, that's the ecosystem we're in. Uh, you actually made me like that piece, which I hadn't really thought that much about before. But, I mean, it ends up seeming, through your narrative, like a really strong piece that is descriptive in a, interesting way. We don't want to give him situation. credit for that necessarily. Yeah, 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 but though. that's hard. Okay. <laughs> but but I, I'm left sort of wanting some more um, information on, because you keep on saying that his thesis is a specialized form of knowledge, mm -hmm. but you, you dismantled, you know, the, the points of Adorno, but I'm not sure I was given all the tools for what mm -hmm. the new specialized form okay, of knowledge Okay, fair is. enough. One of the tools that I've talked about um, in 
over the last couple of pieces I've been working on is what I call refamiliarization. And to me, that seems like a really important counter move to defamiliarization. If the shock affront, you know, effect of, um, you know, as my students got fond of saying, epistemological defamiliarization, um, if that was the kind of, which I, you know, I mean, we love it, right? You know, oh, woo, think again. Um, but refamiliarization is a kind of counter move to that. Um, not unrelated. In other words, it's a kind of in dialogue with it. And what refamiliarization is related to, in my mind, is a kind of systems theory life cycle kind of reading. Um, you know, life cycle studies that are, have you heard of life cycle studies? Um, okay. When you, if you were to look at any object of production and try to understand what it is. You would look at it in terms of the labor, the raw materials, the cost, the shipping, the systems of distribution, everything that goes into making it. So in a sense, it reconnects any discrete object with an entire system within which it's, it, it is produced as a codependent object, right? an emergent object. So it's not a discrete thing separate from that, and that's where the Hearst works really well. So, and I actually think the Collins works really well as um, a piece through which, any of these pieces, through which you can talk about refamiliarization. It's a way of, again, um, rather than thinking in terms of a kind of um, break and only negativity, um, there's a way that you're thinking in terms of connectivity, um, that things are through those connections. So refamiliarization is a term that I've been using to talk about that. So that would be one of the tools for me because it's, you know, what kind of objects allow you to do those kinds of readings? What kind of objects, you know, provoke you enough, are interesting enough? And, you know, actually the Hearst was interesting enough. Like I looked at it and I thought, oh, that's awful. And I thought, no, it's not that simple. And so for me, the problem that it posed for me of, of just thinking through, well, what is that? was, you know, force that kind of, okay, make this connection, make this connection, make this connection. So that's a tool to me of thinking. It's like, how do I think about that? But then I come back and I go, oh, but in fact, it still is awful. It still isn't very interesting. It still is a hood ornament. I say, yes, but it's also this. And it's that back and forth and the fact that it doesn't resolve for me um, is what makes it interesting. And, and likewise with the Collins, I, I could have stood there for hours watching those performances because every performance was interesting in a different way. And yet they were all related to this kind of notion of, you know, how do we have identity in relationship to the monoculture? It's not a monoculture because we live it as, you know, as experiencing subjects. And so these, you know, these individuals were Again, a perfect instance of that kind of example of that kind of refamiliarization. I am and I'm not the thing that I identify with. So there's a continual play there and you know between them and what they aspire to be. So it's that kind of a reading activity. That's one of the tools. Does that make sense? Do you have a Yeah, Jerry. Thank you. Can you hear me? Um, I really like your reading of the Damien Hirst skull, and it is terrifying that way. Um, one thought I had, though, where he may have dismantled that terror is that he bought it back. That, to me, is just and completely part of it. To right, me, exactly. I think that speaks in a way of uh, an onanistic closed system that then uh, is sealed away from the very world that I completely agree with you, that you have to deal with the damn mm -hmm. thing. And yet when he bought it back, I was thinking, oops, mistake. But, but maybe not, maybe you're right. You see, I don't know. See, to me, that makes it even all the more of this kind of you know, manipulative staging because it's like, okay, it's the most valuable object in the world. I'm the, one, I'm the, one who's, I'm the only buyer for it. But, you know? but then when I, what I think is that puts him closer to a more suspect, more Akami, Richard Princeian. When oh, you yeah. think you're gaming the system, mm -hmm. often the system is gaming you, is what right. I guess I think. And I thought... Hearst had actually gamed it, and then when he huh. bought it back, huh. I thought, no, he, See, he, made, he yeah. played by a set of rules that the art world knows so well that we See, would then say what you yeah. said. So that's interesting because I actually saw it as as you know um, sort of setting the the stakes higher, maybe, and and making sure that he would actually win that gamble right. to come back and play it again. 
In other words, because it's we're not over. It's not over. It right? isn't over. It I, isn't I over. I think she's really right there. Yeah, it it's isn't not over. over yet. Right. Just like an auction, it's it's sold today. Right. It's sold tomorrow. That's right. Um, That's two right. other small things. It's I've like been... subprime. I mean, he's like the perfect image of the subprime moment, right? You know, we, we always have the, it's not by accident. I, I don't know what subprime means. The subprime mortgage market collapse? I read about it, though. Oh, OK. Um, the other thing I just wanted to say is, <laughs> our, I mean, I've read about it. I didn't know I what know. it meant with art. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I thought, as an art critic, I felt in a way you were doing an ad Adorno yourself when you were making art criticism kind of the pop culture and theory kind of a higher calling. I mean, you described mm. art criticism as a describer more as, a, as you said, as a bridge, as a this, as a that. And then theory got all the good stuff. And I actually think, <laughs> I think, I think frankly, it's a holistic thing, mm -hmm. that it's all part of the same ball of wax, mm -hmm. that you can't dismiss one without dismissing mm -hmm. the other. And I think mm -hmm. it's a big mistake to, uh, dismiss criticism as, yeah. a, as a category, though I dismiss a lot of critics. Listen, and I'm going to get rid of this damn microphone. I absolutely agree with you. I w absolutely. I completely agree with you and totally take your point. I was actually not trying to dismiss criticism, but to distinguish the project I was, that I'm trying to work on from the task of criticism, which I, I do really you know, love and, and enjoy, but I wasn't trying to do a critical reading of these works as much as to try to talk about the legacy of theory. So I just was trying to make a, a, dis, a kind of a, a distinction that was descriptive. It wasn't in any sense meant to make theory seem like the heavy in the room and criticism seem like the, you know, sort of w weight people who serve up art in a, in a kind of friendly way. But I do think, you know, the task of interpretation is a heady one um, and an intellectual one and a pleasure-driven one. Um, and so, but I, t I, I certainly, if it came off that way, then you're completely right, and I totally agree with you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm coming from outside. My name is Doris von Drayton, and I'm an art crit critic living in Paris, and I did my studies in Hamburg, so in the tradition of Warburg and Panofsky. Um, so it was strange for me in a way that um, you, interesting, but on the same hand astonishing, that for you in a certain way apparently there is like an equation between aesthetics and theory, which is not at all the case, for example, for Abby Warburg, who is saying that, uh, who's even, who is doing an equation between aesthetics and ethics, mm -hmm. and who is saying that uh, in the same way as aesthetics are building up and are controlling in a way the chaotic emotions which are in the first process of, process of creating a work of art um, and then getting to a form which then this form is like getting to a meaning, to imaginary and what you want. <clears throat> In the same way, uh, ethics are controlling and building up our chaotic and emotional way of wanting to act and wanting to behave. And ethics, in a way, are having this controlling uh, function or this controlling role. I was a little bit astonished about not seeing maybe I just didn't get it, or maybe I just didn't understand that, uh, and not seeing how, for example, you would say or you would explain how aesthetics um, are dealt with in these works you, uh, you were chosen. How aesthetics were dealt with, or ethics? Yeah, the, uh, the part of the aesthetic to create that, wor uh, that, that work, for example. Mm -hmm. how form is related to emotions and how form mm -hmm. is related and how uh, as, as how the form and the meaning are then getting to us, the ones who are receiving, I mean critic as well, mm -hmm. um, and then make us write or others just look and understand something. I mean this is what aesthetics is mm -hmm. about, that uh, it is the, uh, the trans transfer uh, between what you're creating as an artist to make it understand to somebody else. 
it's mm -hmm. a bridge. Mm -hmm. That's what I couldn't get. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, again, um, the, the, the tradition of aesthetics that you're talking about is not outside of what I'm describing. The uh, project I had tonight was really to address aesthetic theory. So therefore, you know, my address is, is towards the kind of reformulation of theory that comes out of critical theory, that comes out of a particular... But there are so many, th there are so well, many theories, so how do you do the difference? I mean, already if you do the difference between Abby Warburg Panofsky, it's mm -hmm. like a, it's their world in between. Mm -hmm. uh, and then from there going to uh, Adorno and just quoting here and there some little things, all of a sudden I'm getting like a little warm about it because that's really uh -huh. the culture I'm coming from. Um, well, I, I agree with you that aesthetics, does, uh, that Adorno does not own aesthetics, okay? I mean, you know, and, and that's true. But I think that, again, the particular um, uh, discussion that I'm trying to put forth here does have to do with the legacy of Adorno in particular, and therefore that's the, that's the focus, all right? So, you know, insofar as we could talk about artist's experience and we can talk about the transformation of idea into form and look at the legacy of many other thinkers, aesthetics is a very large field. And I, and I did say that at the beginning. I said, you know, you can look at the history of aesthetics and there are a whole legacy of, of you know, incredibly important writers who are looking at the aesthetics of form and objects and their identity. And, and, and also their functions, as well as looking at aesthetics as a form of experience. Um, and these things are not binaristically opposed to each other. So I think, you know, again, it's not that I'm trying to bracket those, you know, that wonderful tradition of intellectual thinking about art and aesthetics and form out of the field of aesthetics. But I am trying to, in this particular project, address the legacy of Adorno in particular and the way that his aesthetic theory has come to occupy a particular place within cultural studies and critical studies, at least within the American Academy and the British Academy. So I think maybe it's just a matter of understanding what the, the project is. But, you know, um, the, you know, if we came back to the study of aesthetics as you're describing it in terms of form and experience and so forth, I would still suggest that we would want to take that conversation up from a contemporary place in terms of thinking about the nature of knowledge and experience, um, w which would be a more kind of w what I would ground it in what, what the literature would call radical constructivism and the work of people like Ernst von Glasersfeld and the kind of, you know, thinking about epistemology from a contemporary point of view. So, of course, I, I love and respect Panofsky and Warburg and, and, you know, they are all about the social production of meaning in, and the reading of form. So, uh, and yes, and I think recovering them is also, again, part of this, this task, which is to look at things and, and attend to them. But I, looked at, I look at these things. I love looking at them. Um, and that's part of, I think, what, um, you know, they, they are visual objects. Um, and um, so, you know, I don't disagree with you. I just think, again, the, the project I'm sketching out here is specific in terms of why I'm talking about aesthetic theory um, in this context. So that's all. But thank you for your remarks. I mean, it's important to remember that, that other, that, that broader intellectual tradition, for sure, and all that it still has to offer, so. Uh, I just want to thank you for the talk. I found it very, very interesting. And I wanted to say that your distinction between aesthetics and aesthesis, I find very useful um, also to underscore a kind of modality for being in the world more generally, not just right. in the art world. I, I think there are various synonyms for that, such as participatory culture or affective economies, um, immersion, if you think about the gaming industry, for example, virtual reality, and uh, new media technologies as well have, have also heightened, it seems, this sort of um, interest in aesthetic experience or as as a way of being in the world. I, I agree. Yeah. I mean, I actually came around to this project in part because of the work I was doing in, in writing about um, 
you know, how do we challenge the cultural authority of math thesis and, you know, the kind of underlying assumptions that go into computational technologies as they become part of administered culture. And, you know, I mean, I don't want to sound like a total romantic, but I am. I mean, I believe in imagination. I think it really is important. I think it is probably the only um, human capability that actually has the, has the ability to, to lead us forward. Um, you know, there's that tradition of, you know, Blake and Bataille, I mean, I, I believe, you know, and that's outside of moral judgment. And it's not that I'm not ethical and, or believe in ethics, but I think, I actually think uncoupling artistic practice from the task of um, being the moral conscience of the culture is important if we're not going to ha just have didactic art. I, 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 you know, didacticism is, is reified thought. I, it doesn't open up. So that's really my project. But um, Actually, this just happens to carry forward with that. You, you mentioned the crisis of knowledge and that you open up a possibility of, sh of a, a pleasure in looking. And how might that relate to a pleasure in making, especially mm. how the, um, you mentioned in your recent book that the challenges of the artist versus the production values of, say, the culture industry, and especially how that might relate to um, personal craft and right. um, artisanship. Gee, you know, doing yoga or moving or, or making things, I know for myself that is a physically therapeutic exercise, that is a psychologically therapeutic to process things physically. Um, and I do think that there, you know, that there, there's a difference um, between uh, virtual experience and, and embodied experience. I mean, we're always embodied, you know, it's like even you're sitting there in front of the screen. Um, so, uh, you know, I do think that, but the pleasure of making does not always translate into a pleasure of viewing much as we would like it to. Um, so, you know, I think, again, the, you know, we know there's still bad art, you know, there's, there's, and there's good art that's, you know, there's interesting art that's not necessarily perfectly made, um, and, and it's, you know, when, you know, my line with artist books, I mean, it's like I'd much rather look at something that has high conception values and low production values than something that just has high production values and no conceptual values at all. So I think it really comes down to cases. You know, it's like, what is the object you're looking at? And is it succeeding on its own terms? And are the terms interesting? Um, and do they produce some kind of dialogue with a viewer or not? So I, I'm, I'm not sure I've answered your, your question, but um, I was just wondering if, I mean, I, I thought your reading of the Hearst piece was really interesting, and, and I was wondering if you think it either reflects a shift in the perception of the artist's role in society, like, going forward, and or if it's also some kind of a sly statement about what an artist's role is in society. If you, if you sense that it's a reflection of some kind of change of perception of what the artist does in, in society now and going forward, given the information society, or if it's just the work as you interpret it. Yeah, don't, I mean, I don't, I'd be curious to know what you think, but I, I mean, I think it's not that, di I mean, look, Jeff Koons was doing this, you know, 20 years ago. I mean, when Warhol did the dollar sign paintings, he was, he was playing around with that, you know, it's like the bigger the painting, the more, you know, the bigger the dollar sign, the more you pay for it. I mean, I think that, you know, there's a long tradition of, you know, Eve Klein and the immaterial zones of pictorial sensibility. You know, there's a lot of ways that artists have, have called attention. And again, I go back to Duchamp and, and you know, his, the Armat and the, and the urinal, the fountain, you know, is that, you know, artists, conceptual artists have been very interested in exposing the way that value is produced through the um, institutions of art. Um, so I don't think it's really a big shift in that way. It's, it's just a kind of, you know, it's almost like a marker, you know, like a milestone or a watermark of, of how high that, how high the stakes have gone in that game. But I do think the thing that it, it again, it shows is that, you know, for art to matter, I mean, in, in, in a certain crass world, it has to be able to command capital. And if it can't do that, then it's a, then it's a low stakes player. In other words, it's not going to be taken as seriously. Um, and I would that that were not true, but it often is, um, at least in the immediate 
moment of things appearing on the horizon. I mean, over time, you know, the temporal dimension in there, often things that are quite ephemeral and um, you know, not, don't have a lot of capital investment become things that are very valued. But so you know, I think the, that, again, we've seen a history of, of this kind of conceptual engagement for a long time, but it does set a kind of benchmark. And you know, in, in a certain crude way, it says art is still important. We can play up there with you know the condominium game or whatever it is. It's universally very pro art and pro creativity because it, what what you said that I was thinking about was that as you're working with extremely expensive materials, so mm -hmm. so if right. you take an extremely expensive materials and then you you don't actually alter them, but you reconstitute, you, you, re, you reconfigure them, yeah. Reconfigure them and therefore add additional value. You, what he may be interpreted as doing is just doing this, his artistic activity, which right. is a very powerful uh, economic Yeah, the question statement. of where the value comes in, I mean, I, I would sort of argue that, you know, the, the diamonds don't really get more valuable for being stuck on that skull. You know, um, the piece as a whole it acquires a certain kind of value, but again, it's within that set of machinations and so forth. Um, and uh, it, it, it's, you know, whether it's for its artistry in the sense of the object or the artistry in the sense of the larger game, I think is, is the question there, you know, how those two things match up. Um, you know, it's an artistry of, of capacity to position oneself and manipulate, that really is the, um, you know, part of the skill there. Right? That's the artistry um, in some sense. It's not the bauble, you know, it's not the little, little thing. Yeah. Though I like baubles, you know, I mean, it's funny. Hi, I just wanted to, um, you talked a little bit about curatorial practice in a sense because you brought up beyond belief, you know, the mm -hmm. skull being part of a greater exhibition that right. deals with belief systems that are, you know, almost probably greater than the art world itself. Uh -huh. God, death, <laughs> birth, yeah, right. big ones. those big topics. And, um, but a lot of the artists that you're talking about are dealing with those, you know, the sort of bigger, bigger topics. And, and then you mentioned fuzz. and. You know, I don't know if you've seen Unmonumental at the New Museum, but I, w you know, you know, was sort of wondering if you would talk a little bit about curatorial practice within the museum situations and how that might be, you know, related to things that you're thinking about in terms of right. cultural studies. Right. Yeah, I'm. You know, I mean, that's a great question. I'm not really, you know, sort of. Um, prepared to answer it. So, um, not having seen, maybe you would like to answer it. Um, Oh, I think it's interesting that you build a monument and start have an exhibition called Unmonumental yeah. that is really directly sort of from a lineage of, you know, Duchamp, Boys, Richard Tuttle, right. you know, collage, and, and um, that is a, a, you know, a kind of monumental sweep of 20th right. century culture and, um, you know, really dealing with a lot of the kinds of utopian theories um, that you know, that Adorno was professing, so on some level, you know, mm -hmm. maybe not directly, but indirectly, you mm -hmm. know, considering this a time of monuments crashing and, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and yet creating it. So I was, mm -hmm. you know. Well, you know, I think, again, the, the function, you know, of, of these institutional venues is anthropological and sociological in the, in the deepest sense, which is to provide a venue through which to call us to attention. Um, and to to pay attention to um, you know in, in in specialized ways, so it, you know that's how I see um, such things. But I often think, frankly, the rhetoric that goes along with um, much of that work is is sometimes unsustainable. I mean, it's not. It's like really, you know. I mean, it's like you know, again, you know, it's just. Take any average day of going around the galleries as we did today, and you know you see all kinds of work that you know it's like, huh? And then you read the statement, it's like, oh, it's doing this, and it's taking apart that, and it's a critique of this, and it's you know very very political because it's all about you know. And you're looking at this pile of what, and you're saying it is, and it's not. It's it's just not, you know. So again, it's it's that that really sort of drives me right around the bend. It's like, um, okay, you know, it's like if you want to make very delicate, ephemeral work that causes you to have to pause to an extreme degree to even notice it. 
then that's about a way of knowing and attending, and that's a, a sense experience, and I'm all for it. Does it have a kind of capacity to move you towards a sensibility that might ultimately have some kind of counter to the mind-numbing experiences? Yes, you know, of course. It's like we are all trying to have experience. I, you know, I'm just an experience junkie. I want to have experience. So how do you have it? And you know, so that's fine, but if you want me to believe that that little pile of whatever is, you know, the thing that is actually, you know, critiquing, you know, I can't go there. And I just, I don't believe. I, I've, I'm, I have fallen from the faith. So. That's so interesting what you're saying, that you're falling off belief. I think there was never the belief of, of these pilots. I think it's just a mis complete misunderstanding of Duchamp. Because Mich Duchamp, when he put his uh, bottle dryer in the museum, he was not pretending that that was a work of art. He wanted to show with a no work of art the hour of the museum. Yes, yes, yes. No, and no, I, I, I know that about the right. people who are right. just pretending this can be a work of art uh, who are just uh, yeah. following a kind of misunderstanding of Duchamp, no? No, uh, it, no, I'm not talking about Duchamp here. I'm, I'm talking about the critical rhetoric that extends, um, the, the belief system is a critical rhetoric that takes certain kinds of projects and accords them a political efficacy. Yeah. That's, that's what I'm critiquing. The artists are not necessarily pretending. I think they believe. I just don't. I, I'm not talking about Duchamp here. Okay, I'm not talking about the history of conceptualism and the ready-made. I'm talking about um, a discourse of supposed politics in around objects that don't sustain that rhetoric, in my opinion. So that, it's a different. It's a, it's a different conversation than the ready-made conversation. So. Hi. Um, I don't, to preface this by saying, I don't know quite how relevant this question is going to be, but um, I just finished reading a good chunk of John Dewey's ex Art as Experience. And it surprised me in your, in your talking about transformation from aesthetics to a thesis, how much of it kind of reminded me of this book, specifically, of course, about how art is very much a currency of culture and it can't really exist without that. And it uh, obviously would be very against, uh, you know, art existing on a kind of higher plane above everything else. Do you see yourself as having Dewey in roots and? I do. Okay. Dewey was I a guess, smart man. I guess man. it's kind of relevant then. Yeah, Dewey is a really smart man. Artist experience is an important book. Um, I really think it is, um, and uh, you know, and I'm glad you're reading it. I think it's a really good book. So, <laughs> congratulations. Thanks. <laughs> what, what should be my next book then? <laughs> what should be your next next book? Mm, you know, I think Merlot Ponty would be good. The visible and the invisible, and uh, and if you don't want to read that, read Colette's *The Pure and the Impure* because it's really great. <laughs> if you've never read it, I'm serious. You know, read great fiction and 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 literature. But um, you know, Merleau-Ponty is a and, and phenomenology are 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 a wonderful place to go, um, and a kind of counter to Dewey's more groundedness. Um, and I think it would it, it'd be an interesting contrast. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to remember which issue I actually have. Let's see. Um, well, my first issue was with the notion that we started with, that the world is split. And from what you said about Adorno, it was Adorno, right? Yes. Uh, it seems that according to his theories and his systems, that actually art is to blame for the world being split. You don't think so? The, that the minute we diverged, that the minute we stopped reflecting nature, that we started reflecting something else, that it didn't split off in oh, the world? Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, um, let me maybe uh, finish no, your question. That's, that's, okay. that's Yeah, um, well there's sort of two things there. I think it um, starts with impressionism as early as that. I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. 
Um, there's sort of two things uh, there. One is what is the relationship of art to nature in a philosophical sense? In other words, the very act of making, Adorno says, is, is that moment of, of transformation. And he has a whole theory about the shudder, you know, that kind of, that kind of you know, moment of realization that's a kind of you know, transformative. You know, it's no longer simply what is, it is now something that is made. So there is a kind of at least a divide there for him between that condition of what is a priori and that which is made. So he does describe that in a split. But actually what I said at the beginning was not that the world is split, but that the um, modern project that really begins with Romanticism is that the world is broken. Oh, that's what I meant. The world is the world broken. Is broken so. And the world is broken and must be put right in part because there's industrialization and there's the kind of, you know, fall from natural condition. I mean, read Rousseau, right? It's like, you know, we are no longer the pure creatures and industrialization has deformed us and, you know, we are at the mercy of the machines and administered culture. But remember, that has a much deeper history within Judeo-Christian thought that has those, to do with, but, you know, the fall. Yes. Um, exactly. It just seemed to me that there was that the world is broken, mm -hmm. that, that the artifice of art separated from the things of history and of the world and of people as, as cost, a rarefied yeah. thing was partially responsible for a brokenness. The I see what you're saying. Yeah, I think it and that, that not, not to braid art because we're all here right. because we love art, but it's an interesting, I think, I don't know, it just seemed to me that there was a split, you know, an intellectual split whatever you want to call it, whoever it came from, mm -hmm. you know. There's a split when, when, if you think about the difference between modern art and modernity and traditional arts and their integrated relationship to culture that, you know, again, historically, art becomes a specialized realm of its own commodity production in the modern period. It becomes a, a thing apart. And that's true. That's another kind of split. But I don't think that, um, you know, again, Adorno would say that split is responsible for what's wrong with the world. What's wrong with the world, you know, in a, in a Marxist sense, is the unequal distribution of, you know, labor and power. Um, right. and, and economic resources. So the, the brokenness that comes into political, you know, that political philosophy talks about from the, from the 19th century onward um, is charged with this task of fixing. We have to change it. And I believe that. I do think the world is broken and we have to change it. But I believe that from inside the brokenness, in other words, I'm part of that. I'm not outside of that. I'm not better than that. I'm, a, you know, I'm complicit with it at the same time that I honestly believe that we have the task of trying to you know, reimagine a, a, a way to, to go forward. So, and, so I think there are different kinds of, of of, broke, of splits there, that's all. Certainly. Um, my other issue maybe, maybe addresses this in a part two. It was the, the whole sort of implicit um, feeling that I get when we're talking about her skull and sort of any artwork that takes a lot of money to make is that it's morally vapid and has fallen away from aesthetics, has it's fallen shameless. Away. It's utterly shameless. Well, I don't know. I, I mean, I think is it shameless? Is utter, it's is it's utterly shameless, shameless that we don't right. talk about the moral and ethical aspects of the work at all. And that when it's like saying, well, Madonna made an artwork, therefore it's just something. That's, you know, but when the artist makes, Hearst makes art about mortality because he's Hearst and not Phil Collins or someone not as, as you know, recognized to be as dastardly as him, but of course he's just trying to throw out a, another Duchampian model about everything, but about mortality in particular. And there's a lot of art these days about mortality. There was just a show at Kyman Reed with some wonderful work. I think it falls under the same rubric, but it never gets discussed in those terms, ever. Well, again, it's a, it, well, we avoid I, it like the plague. We avoid talking about Hearst as a moral artist. I. I don't agree. I actually think that by saying that, that Hearst is completely shameless, I have said something about Hearst as an utterly unmoral artist. And I think that, that again, I believe that. I think he That's is fine. not I, I just think that... I don't think he cares I think that any time we, we take... I, 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 you right. take uh, a skull, you know, uh -huh. the, <laughs> the, the objectified object of humanity, uh, 
and make it into, you know, a, a, take away its taboo, its totemized quality, reduce it to an ornament. I mean, that was done with a lot of art about, about mortality mm -hmm. recently, whether it included body parts or not. Mm -hmm. You know, what about the body show that's touring the country? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, mm -hmm. there's various examples, but there's I would love to hear some talk about ethics and, and in art more than I do. Mm -hmm. And do we? Well, you know, if that's the direction you want to write in, you should write in that direction. Again, aesthetic territory and discourse exist to be invented, and conversations are all to be made. So if that's the direction in which you want the conversation to go, you should do it. You know, it is, I actually am not in myself interested in trying to task art with a moral, to be the moral conscience of the culture. I think that, again, it leads to didacticism, to turn around and try to read Hearst in a moral tone, I think is to, it, it, it's useful, but I think it, mis, it, it, it misses the point, which is that he is really deliberately shameless and trying to move, and, and trying to make it impossible for those arguments to even take hold. You know, it's like he, he's thumbing his nose at it. He's, you know, what, you're going to say, oh, I'm not ethical? I mean, it's ridiculous. It's beyond, it's beyond belief, all right? He said so himself. So okay. I think that's a good moment to end. Thanks.